to you in peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Uh, this, this day is a, a fascinating day for, for our, in Christianity because it's the culmination of so much. Uh, things that, that it, the story of creation is, uh, and the story of the fall is like you take a, a rock and you drop it into a still pond and it ripples outward and outward, dis distorting the, the view. And uh, that's a good sort of analogy of what sin does. It sort of distorts the view of everything. It, it distorts our view of God. It distorts our view of one another and even of ourselves. And through God's continual work through his people of Israel and through Christ, and now in this day of, uh, when we celebrate the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God comes back to, to blow back on creation and still those waters once again so that we can, through Christ and by the power of that same Spirit, see again more clearly, at least, who this God is, so that we're not afraid of Him, so that we don't do crazy kind of sacrifices for Him, so that we're not always afraid that we haven't done enough, but instead, instead here in this clear view of God, again in Christ, crucified and risen from the dead, we see the one who sends his love to us in his son. And even though we crucified him, he still sends that love to us, and not just to us, says the day of Pentecost, but to all creation. In the Old Testament, there are a variety of things that point forward to this. One of those is, is, a, uh, is in the Psalms. It, it talks about, it talks about uh, that when the Spirit comes, it will restore life to all creation. Just, just, uh, there's a, another phrase that comes up, that it's kind of fun in Hebrew, it's like, La shuv yashuv, the turn of the turning. And finally things get turned back right again. And that's the proclamation of the church in every age that finally, finally things have been begun to be turned back right again in Jesus. And we can see now clearly that God isn't a God of anger and violence, that God is a God of love. And we can see one another as, as beautiful yet warped creatures, that we are beautiful yet warped, not always just awful people, but beautiful because we're created in the image of God, and yet still warped in all kinds of different ways. And then we see one another in that same light and say, hey, I'm warped too. <laughs> I may be warped in a little different way than you are, but we're all warped. And for all of us warped people, it was, it was who Jesus came. Remember, Jesus says, I didn't come to heal the sick, to, to heal those who are well. I came for those who were sick, because those are the ones who need healing. I came to give life and love and hope again to them. And so the Old Testament lesson for today, the story of Ezekiel and the Valley of Dry Bones, and I promise not to sing the song about <laughs> the ankle bone being connected to the shin bone. But I've always loved that phrase there, and suddenly there was a great sound, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone, and then later there were sinews on them. Did, did you hear why that was? It's because the Spirit came upon them. The, the, the prophet Ezekiel was given the command to prophesy to the, to the wind or to the breath or to the Spirit, and it would come on them. And it, caused them to, to gather together these bones that were disconnected and jointed, disjointed and dried out in the sun in this valley. And then there were sinews that grew on them and muscles and skin and bones they stood up and, 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 the, and the, God says to Ezekiel again, now prophesy again to the Spirit that they would live. And they'd live again. I don't know what you know about Ezekiel, but uh, if you want to read some really wild stuff, read the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a priest at the time when uh, the Babylonians had conquered Jerusalem. Babylonians came against the city twice in about uh, 5, uh, 614, 589, something like that. So, uh, 5th, 6th century BC, uh, or 6th, 7th century BC. And, uh, and they destroyed the city the first time, but they only took away into captivity like the cream of the crop. So, Ezekiel was one of those, he had been one of the higher up priests in the, in the temple in Jerusalem. So, it took him away along with a bunch of other leadership and left a bunch of others behind. And the, what they thought was it was just going to be a brief period of time, and then they would go back. And so God's message through Ezekiel, through a variety of kind of strange things that he's told to do, the message is, no, you're going to be here for a while. And then after, in 586, when the city finally fell and the, the rest of the people came, Israel felt like God abandoned them, that there was no hope. Like they were just <clears throat> an army that had been defeated and their bodies left in the field to rot. They were just hopeless. And it was at that time that God came to Ezekiel and he says, I have a message that you are to give to these people. It's a message of hope. But I have not abandoned you. There is still hope. What's going on now isn't your destruction. It's your discipline. And there's hope. And so he shows in this particular part of the book of Ezekiel, he, sees, he shows Ezekiel this vision of a valley filled with dry bones. And you're not supposed to like have in your mind a valley of sort of intact skeletons, just a valley of bones. Just sort of 
distributed by wind and water and animals, just dry, disconnected bones that are all over the place. And he's told, prophesy to the bones, and the bones come together, and then there are sinews on them, and then there's skin, and then they stand, but they're not yet alive. He says again, now prophesy, prophesy to the spirit, and, come, and there's another rushing sound, and then they live. The whole point of all of this is, you may feel like there is no hope. You may feel like God isn't powerful here in Babylon. You may feel like God doesn't care about you, but there's hope because you've not been abandoned. And that spirit continues to come to you through the word of the prophets, through the word of, of those who speak that word of God. And so fast forward a while to, uh, to the day of Pentecost, that 50 days after Jesus is raised from the dead, and 50 days later when the spirit comes again and takes this disconnected people. Uh, you probably, you may or may not know, but what happened was after the, the uh, people were taken away into captivity in Babylon, then they came back. Some of them, some of them went other other places. So there were Jews in Rome, there were Jews in southern France, there were Jews in what is today Iran, there were, there were Jews in, in Egypt, there were Jews all over the place. They were scattered and disconnected, and they didn't have hope that God would finally come and restore everything. They wished, and they came together for these festivals, but it really didn't seem like there was real hope for it, at least not anytime soon. And yet, while they're all there together, at the celebration of the Jewish festival of Pentecost, it begins. They're drawn back together by the spirit of the word of God, by this, by this amazing message that God has in Christ reconciled not just them, but all of the world to himself, all the world to himself. Their whole lives had been, we need to be separate from everybody else. We need to keep ourselves pure and clean. We need to keep ourselves not like the other people. And they go there to, for this Jewish festival, and they hear this Jewish priest, uh, pastor speaking, this Jewish apostle, this follower of Jesus speaking, and he says, what we've been about has been being accomplished, and when we go back, we speak this message for the life of the world, that God has not abandoned his people, that we are still loved. And we can bring that message not just to our own people, but to others as well. So to read the rest of the New Testament, you find that frequently the message of Jesus was there ahead of the disciples, ahead of Paul who had already been there. Sometimes there's already a little church there, uh, ahead of Peter, no matter where he goes, because the Spirit had already pushed this message out so that by the time that the apostles, the disciples came later on, it would be something to work with, a word that was already planted there, which could be caused to grow. That message is a great message for uncertain times, whether it's personal uncertain times or national uncertain times or global uncertain times, or all three at the same time. <laughs> because sometimes it does seem, doesn't it, like we will never be able to get over violence. War after war, school shootings, random murders, drugs, it's a mess. It's a mess. And sometimes you look at it and it's like, it's like a valley of dry bones, because nothing's going to put this back together. Nothing will put this back together. It doesn't matter what you do, nothing will put this back together. Or nationally, too, nations divided. Nations get divided. It happens, and, and we're tempted to look out and see just dry bones. There's nothing that will put this back together. There's nothing that will make this whole. And in our own personal lives, there are times when it does seem like God's just not there. Prayers seem to go unanswered, sometimes even hard to, to just get up the energy even to pray because it doesn't seem like anything happens. Because whatever it is, our lives just seem like a valley of dry bones, disconnected, unable to come together. We can't figure it out. And so we do stupid things. We all do. Because it doesn't seem like there's any hope. But the day of Pentecost, it's a reminder that no matter how dry the bones, God's word is wet with promise. One of the things I loved about living in the desert, this is about the only thing I loved about living in the desert, uh, where uh, my parents, I've lived there for a few years with my parents, my mom still lives down there, is dew in the morning. Dry as, dry as dust the rest of the day, but dew in the morning. And the little green things that would grow just because there was some dew in the morning. Because water is wet with promise. When we gather at a baptism, it's that promise in the wet water and the word of God that causes life to grow. And it's that same 
word, that same powerful, wet word of God that comes to drench us again when we feel like we're dry, disconnected, and without. It's like jumping in the pool on a hot day. It's like getting a nice shower after you worked all day and you feel dry and dusty. It's the refreshment of God and this promise. That even though sometimes we feel dry and disconnected, like our own lives are in some sense a valley of dry bones, or even in a society where it seems like there's no hope for getting back together, it's just a valley of dry bones, or a world where there is only war after war, conflict after conflict, violence upon violence, it just seems like it's a valley of dry bones. But the promise on a day like today, the day of Pentecost, and the promise that we live with each and every day, because we live under the influence of the Spirit who brings that word to bring life is this. There is always hope. Because our God is a God of hope. Our God is a God who in a vision puts dry bones together, but in real life put the people of Israel back together. He, doesn't only, he hasn't only caused wars to cease, but he caused communities to come together. He doesn't only speak a word that tells me that he sort of generally is love, but he comes into my life to give that love that overwhelms. He comes into my life to give forgiveness and the promise of grace always. It would have been fun to be with Ezekiel that day because we know how it ends. But I imagine for Ezekiel that day, he had no idea what was going on. And he went up and saw this valley of dry bones and I think he probably thought, Yep, that's us. At the end of the story, a new life, a new hope for Ezekiel to take back to his people. It's the same for us because we know the end of the story, right? We know of Jesus' resurrection from the dead so that death itself can't even hold us. We know of Jesus' forgiveness of sin so that our sin and our guilt no longer destroys us. We know. We know that he's going to come again because the same spirit that was poured out on the apostles on the day of Pentecost has been given to us in our baptism and feeds and nourishes us in the body and blood of Jesus when we gather together for his supper so that always we go with the love and the life and the grace and the mercy of God to share that with a dry and dusty world. May God in his mercy and his grace always, always remind you that even though you feel nothing better, nothing can happen, nothing good is going to happen, the kind of God we have is the kind of God who puts dry, dusty bones back together, who raises people from the dead, who gives life and hope where there seems to be none, because he is love. In Jesus' name, amen.